However, there is an important sense, there is an important sense in which psychotherapy, even as we know it today, can be can trace its roots much further back, perhaps all the way back to into prehistory. Before such ideas were committed to writing, modern psychotherapy, especially in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, the most modern of our contemporary schools, can also be viewed as part of an ancient therapeutic tradition derived from the informal philosophical circles surrounding Socrates several thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, and therefore stretching back to the Athens in the 5th century BC. Of the various schools of Socratic philosophy, the one that bears the strongest therapeutic orientation is undoubtedly Stoicism, especially that of the later Roman schools. According to Galen, the physician, according to Galen, the physician to the Stoic Emperor Marcus Aurelius, Chrysippus, one of the founders of Stoicism, uh, emphasized, remember the real founder was Zeno, hundreds of years before Seneca, uh, Marcus Aurelius, and uh, Epictetus, as we've talked about. But the founders of Stoicism emphasized the role of philosophers as that of physician of the soul. Isn't that interesting? Someone whom we would now refer to as a psychotherapist. Guys, how's it going? Awesome mail, rhymes with KO, bigria.com. This is the book review of the, phil- phil- the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. This is something that we've been talking about. Guys, we've gone over the Stoicism book reviews. If you haven't seen, well, what are you pointing to? My skin stuff, you guys? They're getting better. I keep, every time you do that, oh, Mr. Gorgeous, I haven't been controlling this. You can control this. I thought it was on screen. All right, so I don't know. I might be off screen, but you guys, this is a, this is a book review. One of the most requested book reviews that we've had because of this idea. We've gone over Stoicism. We did a book review on Marcus Aurelius, uh, Seneca, Epictetus. We haven't done Zeno, but if we do that, those are the four, the three to four. I'd say the three, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus are really the main pushers of Stoicism, and they spread it. Socrates kind of started that, but this is a co- combination of both therapies. ABA, which is more famous therapy. We do, guys, bigria.com. These are one-page book reviews. The, we take these books, put all the best ideas in a one-page, um, the best excerpts from the book, but also we're building the world's largest special needs organization of special needs business owners and real estate investors. We're the number one channel in Indiana, for number one YouTube channel for Indiana real estate, all kinds of stuff. Go to bigria.com. The thing today, though, is that all the therapy and stuff that I've been involved with most recently, if you don't know, my son has uh, special needs and he was uh, extreme. He was diagnosed as extremely, he, he was going to have to be institutionalized. A lot of that has to come with abuse. I adopted him, so I, I wasn't there for that. Um, I didn't see it up close, but there was all kinds of crazy stuff that happened. But this kind of therapy and these ideas of therapy, I've been involved with the last couple of years heavily. This idea is a perfect marriage of the stuff we've been talking about, stoicism and CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy and what it's used for. This is, um, some of you have asked about doing this and what, what my thoughts are on this. I think all this stuff, it's this idea of finding gratitude, of finding solace within. Stoicism is a belief system fo- focused on virtue, unattachment, anti-materialism, reason, wisdom, your inner game, thought control. Guys, go through our book reviews and all the stuff with Stoicism and you will have a better idea. I've had a lot of great feedback from you guys, which I appreciate so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for making this the number one channel for Indiana real estate and having hockey stick growth. We really appreciate you guys. Are amazing. A thousand views a day now, 1,500 or 150 downloads a day in 30 countries. You guys are amazing. I love you. Go to bigreal.com. A lot of, all this stuff is free. You can download this stuff. CBT, this cognitive into behavioral therapy. If you don't know, it's a psychological treatment for depression, anxiety, addiction, marital issues, self-harm, mental illness. Within our special needs world, we have mental handicaps, physical handicaps. We have terminal illness, mental illness, addiction, all kinds of stuff that we treat within the world of special needs. This is something that I've been versed in a little bit. I've been trained. I'm not certified at all for this or ABA. Not certified for really anything because I just do this stuff. Even with my neurologist, that was just me interning. I'm still working there, but I have no, I don't have a degree in any of that stuff. And I haven't been officially certified. I'm an assistant instructor now though. That's interesting. I got a badge and everything. Thing. Not that I made the badge myself just to have one. What am I? Guys, summary here of this book, How Modern Psychotherapy Borrows from Ancient Philosophers Going Back to Socrates. That would be a one-sentence summary. The, no, this uh, author is a psychotherapist and hypnotherapist. You can read more about him at the link below. You can check out his stuff. This whole concept, all we're going to talk about today is the ideas that we've been discussing about stoicism and how to introduce those ideas into therapy, into better questioning, into thought control, and how it can make a bigger difference. Lesson, build better mental habits and reaction. Cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is the predominant school of modern evidence-based psychological therapy. As the name implies, it employs both cognitive and behavioral interventions. Unfortunately, the name belies the fact that CBT is concerned with helping clients to deal with irrational or disturbing emotions and to cultivate rational, healthy, and proportionate ones in their stead. The terms cognitive and rational also suggest to some people's minds that CBT must be a form of rationalization or that it neglects emotion, intuition, or practical experience. I've had this dealing with a lot of people. Most of the people that are trained in this are professionals like psychologists and psychotherapists, as he's describing. I've worked with a lot of these people, and there is this notion that they're not really dealing with the issue, they're just dealing with the same symptoms. And I don't know if this book completely alleviates that concern, but there he is he is pointing that out. So that's, that's good. However, in the sense of the word, CBT is probably anti-rationalist in its emphasis upon the value of behavioral experiments and emp- empirical observation. In other words, CBT emphasizes that insofar as it is reasonable to do so, beliefs should be tested out in practice in the laboratory of our personal experience. Marcus Aurelius speaks of the Stoic philosopher training himself to become, quote, an athlete of the greatest of all contests, the struggle to not be overwhelmed by anything that happened. This right here is kind of the 
summary of what you can do or what the, 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 the concept should be for all of us. The reason I got into all this stuff more recently is we dealing with people who are walking around with a stage four diagnosis, stage four cancer. They're telling you, they're sending you home saying, hey, there's not much we can do for you here. And in those situations, you're not going to find solace. You're not going to find comfort. You're not going to find brilliance. You're not going to find these uh, reasons to move forward with anything external. Everything external, people are around you, they're crying. When your parents are seeing these, a lot of these people are teenagers. Their parents are crying when they see them and they're just around death all the time. All their friends are people they met in these cancer wards that are also dying. And in those moments, it becomes more important than ever that you get to a place of high frequency or you get into a place of flow or having the, um, you know, what they call in the zone with athletes called. It's the most important thing I've learned. The single biggest secret is that you're able to get your frequency of thought high, high frequency thinking so that you can bring the best version of yourself to the whatever life you have left. And then through that lens, seeing the world and seeing your opportunities. Anything that can do that is what you should do. Lesson, focus on the ideal future, high frequency thinking, and never lose sight of it. If, you, if our emotions are not ultimately determined by external events alone, but by our own beliefs and value judgments, then the habit of making healthy and rational judgments is more valuable to us than anything else. Basically what I just said, begin with the end in mind. As one of the seven habits recommended in the decades, uh, in the decade, in the recent decades by the best-selling self-help author, Stephen Covey, it is not a trivial matter to observe that unlike stoicism and most classical philosophies, CBT lacks any clear account of the ideal toward which it aims. Not exactly, you know, not 100% true, but by contrast, one of the most fundamental techniques of ancient philosophical therapy appears to have been the public discussion and private contemplation and visualization of the sage and his virtues, the imaginary embodiment, ideal role model, and ultimately end or goal of the philosophical practice. If guilt serves a purpose, it is surely to motivate us to change today in order to prepare for tomorrow, but not to contemn ourselves to endless complaining about yesterday. Don't mope around. This is something that happens quite a bit. And it's not, you know, it's like one of those things where, what are you going to do? You're going to tell someone not to mope about going to chemotherapy every day or not to mope that they have to go get dialysis every 48 hours or 72 hours. Otherwise they'll die. Who's, who are you or me who are thank, you know, blessed and to have a healthy body to go talk to somebody like that? This is the world I've been in the last few years, by the way. But it is this idea that understanding that I would say the most important place, there is a, a famous story. Um, well, I won't get to that right now because it's kind of a, it's a pretty crazy stuff. But this, um, I, she was telling me this earlier and I, I don't want to say, right, we're going to talk about that later. But the, the, you guys, you got to find, you got to be able to find, go to a place of gratitude. This place of focusing on the ideal future, what you want, high frequency thinking. And when you do that, that frequency of thought is high. It'll ripple through your whole body. All the billions of trillions of cells in your body are all waiting for your brain because that's how they know how they should act and how you should be. Why do you keep pointing to say, oh, are we trying to move Mr. Gorgeous? Did you move him? I didn't do that. No, you can. You can put him wherever, wherever you want. Yeah, it's, no, just take it. You can take over. Yeah, you got it. Like, I, live in accordance with your purpose, destiny, and virtue alignment. The ideal state of the human mind is not irrational indulgence in, mere, in the mere sensory pleasure, hedonism, therefore, but something known as eudaimonia. This is the eudaimonic the approach. We talked about this in the book review on Aristotle, the, uh, the Nicomachean Ethics. A Greek term that encompasses rational fulfillment, happiness, and well-being. If demon, daemon, daemon, were taken simply to mean mind, the word eudaimonia would, could, could be literally translated as mental health. Although this does fail to do justice, the metaphysical connotations of the Greek word, which can also be taken to mean, also be taken to mean being on good terms with one's inner daemon, daemon, daemon. I've been hearing that. I've looked this up a few times because some people call it demon. That's, the, but I'd say daemon's a better way to call it. Daemon or God, a concept not unlike the Christian idea of the conscience, of the conscience. In any case, the cardinal virtue or quality, ereti, that contributes to eudaimonia is simply wisdom, sophia, or if you prefer, it could be translated as meaning philosophical enlightenment. Knowing this leads to us to value and pursue the cultivate the cultivation of human wisdom above all else, which is illustrated in the very word philosophy, the love of wisdom. This is the idea where in the time that you have left, understanding that when, like when, what Socrates calls, you know, checking in, connecting to the deep, the great knowledge. Uh, Plato called it the hope. Aristotle called it the virtue. This idea that everything in the universe, the universe wastes nothing. Everything has a purpose. And as soon as you get aligned with that, you can do anything. You can have high frequency thinking constantly. This is what to take away from this. This eudaimonic pleasure, this not having platonic relationships or platonic relationships are actually, doesn't mean they're much deeper than just a physical or a transactional relationship. It's having something much deeper and looking for relationships like that in the people that you work with. This is like the core stuff. Not that I'm paraphrasing what he's saying and adding our own stuff to it, but this is like the core stuff of all our training. Philosophy in the concrete sense, the everyday pursuit of wisdom is therefore defined as the art of living, the highest human purpose. Through different schools of ancient philosophy differed on their, though different schools of ancient philosophy differed on their interpretation of specifically how this was to be put into practice, it should be evident that for Socrates and the Stoics, the notion that the goal of human life is the pursuit of wisdom does not equate to saying that the meaning of life is that one should spend it reading books on philosophy, but rather one should strive for practical wisdom and facing everyday challenges. This is the same thing. Don't become like, people ask me this, they, sometimes people go through binge watch our stuff, which I so appreciate. But guys, if you had one thing to do, if I had one suggestion is anytime you go through anything at Big Ray or anywhere else, take a note of something you can do. We have this, this process we call by five by Friday 
in by the first. This is, has to do with a lot of like in our inner city heroes right now, we're building 1 million inner city business owners under the age of 21, under the age of 25, depending on who you ask. But it, the idea is that we can get people to either start a business or get a full-time employment before they're 21. And if they have a kid, marry the person. If we do those couple of things we do, your your chances of ever being on poverty are reduced by like 90%, 95%. We're almost certain you're not going to be there. And it's this idea that in, of all the things that are wrong, you know, disparate, um, you know, uh, disparate uh, opportunities, all kinds of racism, prejudice, and redlining, all kinds of things that happen. These are all accurate things that happen if you're in the inner city. The number one thing you got to look at is what can you do by five? What can you do by Friday? And what can you do by the first? And that gives you an idea of what you can do today, what you can do this week, and what you can do this month. It gives you immediately goes for our goals, objectives, and targets. You have daily targets, weekly objectives, and monthly goals. You've got to be able to translate the stuff you're learning into immediate action. This right here is like the whole core of everything I say. Sometimes I'll say to people that we have critics, believe it or not, somebody, people who are not in love with me, people who just can't understand how a mind this really could be contained in a body this beautiful. I don't know. How am I supposed to know? But I always say, would you say if you go to the stuff at bigreader.com, it is the most brilliant, amazing, life-changing material and you feel like your destiny is being fulfilled going through it. And people start laughing when I say that. I get that, okay? But here's the thing. It is that to other people, right? So wouldn't it make sense for me to focus on those people instead of LCs or people who maybe aren't as uh, as committed or aren't as, uh, they're not not as moved by it? Shouldn't I focus on them? And people say, well, I guess, yeah, from your point of view, you should. Well, shouldn't you do the same thing? Shouldn't you go find something that puts you in alignment with who you're supposed to be, connects you to the deep current is a high frequency thought for you. You should be doing that. You should be getting out of bed like a bullet. You should be unstoppable. You should be in the place where you feel it's that it's that contradiction, right? The sense of nostalgia is both pain and pleasure, right? You want to feel that sense. You want to get out of bed like a bullet. You want to feel both the timelessness, but also time speeding up. Time slows down, but also you look at the clock. It's been three hours, but it felt like five minutes. But at the same time, time slows down when you're doing it, right? It's your, uh, what you're doing is effortless. It seems easy, but you're doing something very difficult, right? That's how you know you're in the zone. You're in the flow or what we call high frequency thinking because that is people talk about it like when they say flow we're in the zone that's not very specific high frequency thinking is go through our class on quantum physics for real estate investors it's the frequency of thinking we can measure this mathematically where your thinking should be where you're doing something you're constantly progressing both winning and losing are equally unattractive you just want to keep going you ever start running and all of a sudden you get tired but then you keep going through it and then you don't want to stop you start setting records you were going to go run maybe one or two miles now you run three five ten fifteen twenty miles you're tapped into something else tesla called it the source said i don't know where it is but i know how to get there you get there with your frequency of thinking where you're at. This right here, this diagram, you should print this out and staple it to your genitalia until you're living it. What you love, here's a combination of where you want to be. What you love up here, what you're good at, and what the world needs right now. This is the, the three things. This is kind of how you find your destiny, what you're supposed to be connected to, the eudaimonic pleasure, the eudaimonic virtue, where you should be. The, the combination of what you love and what you're good at is your passion. What you're good at and what the world needs is your gift. And what you love and what the world needs is your calling. When you combine your passion, your calling, and your gift, right? Focus on these things. What you love, what you're good at, what the world needs right now. That is your destiny. All our stuff at BigRia.com is to help people and help us ourselves fulfill destinies, right? To, to go out there, you should be out, get out of the bed, get out of bed like a bullet, take on the world, be unstoppable, and you can do it when you can when you're in the perfect center of these three things. This is where we want to be. Whenever I do any kind of therapy, the reason I haven't been certified by any of these people or any our results that we have, I'm not loyal to any of these things. I'm loyal to what gets the result. All I want to do when people ask me, like our goal here with the special needs heroes or anybody else, it is this, this diagram. In a sense, you should be living your destiny. And all of us, whether we're in behavioral therapy, whether we have parents with special needs kids or whether we're not, it doesn't even matter if they're special needs. I'm just saying those are the hungriest people. And when they get a chance and opportunity to compete in the real world, like in, with normal people or whatever, man, they're just so fucking hungry and so grateful and so filled with ambition. They go out there and they just paint the town red, man. They can do all kinds of amazing things, but it doesn't matter where you're at. This is our purpose. This right now, it's actually on the back of the, on the back of all our doors here. We put this on here. This is where you should be. When you're connected here, you're not going to get tired. You're not going to slow down. You're not going to have a problem. You're going to do, you're going to look forward to eating vegetables. You're going to have anti-fragility the same things that get in your way now are just going to zoom by you. You're going to be in the matrix. You can slow down. Bullets just pass you by and you're not going to, you're going to be in a totally different place mentally, physically, when you're aligned with what you should be doing. This is what all of our therapy should be. And this is why um, we have a lot of disagreement from people who say, well, this is, this is like, what are you talking about? This, this level of ambition is just, it's not realistic. It is realistic. Check out the stories. Check out the success stories we're having with our heroes. It is realistic. If we bring this to everything we do, if you're not thrilled, if you're not grateful, if what you're doing right now does not feel like you're fulfilling your destiny, stop doing it. Go do something else where you do feel that because as long as you feel this with your work you'll make sure that whatever you do other people get there as well all right lesson love what happens weaponize your response you control it seneca defines a reserve clause by the following formula i want to do such and such as long as nothing happens which may present an obstacle to my decision he gives the example i will sail across the ocean if nothing prevents me and elaborates nothing happens to the sage contrary to his expectations i mentioned this quote in the seneca book review for he foresees that something may intervene which prevents that which is planned from being carried out what he thinks above all else above all is that something can always oppose his plans, but the pain caused by failure must be
must be lighter for those who, for, for who has not promised success to himself beforehand. It's this idea that it doesn't matter when you say we're going to make 30 grand a month, for example, obviously you want to get there, but more importantly is how you get there and the things, the lessons and the things you can learn along the way, knowing that no matter what, it's, things work out the best for people who make the best out of the way things work out, right? That is ultimately what stoicism is. And that's really what all this, this is about is no matter what happens, because truthfully, the reason I spend so much time on this is a lot of times, a lot of our heroes, especially the parents, when they go, they're getting bad news constantly, bad news, quote unquote. But the idea that Epictetus says is nothing is bad, save your thoughts. It's not what happened. It's the way you're thinking about what happened, right? But you can always find a path to gratitude. The Stoic therefore makes a point of qualifying the expression of every intention by introducing the distinction between his will and external factors beyond his control. The sage thereby holds two co complementary propositions in mind simultaneously. One, I will do my very best to succeed. Two, while simultaneously accepting that the ultimate outcome is beyond my direct control. It implies I will try to succeed, but I'm prepared to accept both success and failure with equal, with, equi with equanimity, and thereby recognizes human fallibility. Centuries that are Christian theologians would signify the same notion by appending the letters DV or DO Valente, God willing, to their correspondent. Basically, having some belief it's something higher. God willing, we always say this, Godspeed. One of the reasons we say that is because it's not as important that you get what you want, because sometimes the thing you want is not what's in your best interest. But it might be in your best interest to have something else, and it takes you on a journey that makes you better. You take that attitude, you go in the world with that attitude that Godspeed, I'm just going to go 1%, the universe is going to make me 99%. Nothing happens to me, but everything happens for me. These are the ideas that ultimately will allow you to be unstoppable no matter what happens. Even if, if you ask people, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to you? It is what I describe with our heroes, right? Having, it's not something that happens to you, but something that someone you love, something awful happened to them, some sickness, some illness, right? I know I keep talking about that, but that is what we've applied. The, you know, we're in that world. I bring this up again and again, because whatever you got you going on, man, you ain't got no problem, man. You, you, you talk to some of our heroes and deal with what they're dealing with. And oh my goodness, man, you'll, there's that old saying, you, if you went to a party with all the world's problems, each of us would be thrilled to go home with just our own. Lesson, do and calibrate, be a librarian of info, be a librarian of info, but a warrior of execution. Cicero uses his analogy of the archer shooting an arrow at a target. His ultimate wish is to hit the target, but he can only do everything within his power to shoot his arrow straight. And so shooting straight, as opposed to actually hitting the target, must be his primary concern. And so it is with life in general. Nowadays, all that anyone can ask is that you try your best. Marcus Aurelius writes, thanks to action with a reserve clause, there can be no obstacle to my intention. As long as I'm wanting to do the right thing, I can go forward and make sure that I'm shooting right. Underline this conviction is a parallelism between is a parallelism between physical and spiritual exercises, just as by dint of repeated physical exercises, athletes give a new form and strength to their bodies. So the philosopher develops his strength and soul, modifies his inner climate, and transforms his vision of the world and finally his entire being. Bit by bit, movement by movement, right? Um, the, the recent decades have seen growing interest in movement called philosophical practice and other attempts to promote philo philosophy outside of the academic institutions as something that ordinary people do in cafes or applying their own life problems in the form of individual counseling or group sessions with a quasi-therapeutic style. There's some criticism in this book. I left that out of this kind of approach. I, everyone should be doing this. Everyone should be questioning your own thoughts. You should be interrogating the own limitations you have, your own goals, and constantly be um, you know modifying them to get better and better. What do you keep pointing? Oh no, you can put them wherever you want. It doesn't doesn't matter. You could I didn't I didn't know where you would put them, but I no I wasn't pointing to it. You didn't have it wherever you want to put it. Put Mr. Gorgeous up there. Recent decades have shown like ordinary people doing cafes, group with a quasi therapeutic style. Even many academic philosophers appear to crave, quite understandably, a return to the days when philosophical discourse was meant to be rooted in corresponding behavioral and emotional transformation, not merely an academic pursuit or abstracted from any practical application. Is that really the case? I don't know. The ancients conceived of the ideal philosopher as a veritable warrior of the mind, a spiritual akin to Hercules himself. But since the demise of the Hellenistic schools, the philosopher has become something of more bookish, not a warrior, but a mere librarian of the mind. This idea that you know, you've read stuff, you can store it, you know where to find it, but you're not actually executing it. This is one of the things I've been so adamant about these book reviews, because I see people do book reviews online and stuff. What I don't hear is people taking, take, you don't need to summarize or paraphrase a person's words. Take the best words in that book and put them in one place. That's what I've always wanted. Just, it's not a summary, but more of a, you know, taking that and truncating it into a, into tiny bites and then having commentary on that. And that's what I've tried to do with these book reviews. And I appreciate the, 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 the feedback that we get from the, those of you that go through these. It's, we really appreciate it enormously. And I really am thankful for it so much. Not as many of you are, these, these are the, the least, uh, um, some of the least uh, popular videos that we make these book reviews, but I don't give a shit. We keep doing it. And I appreciate you guys so much. It's because of you, the, the, the smaller group, but the more excited group and the more passionate group. And you guys give so, so much great feedback. I really appreciate it so much. Guys, that's a book review of the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy. We talked about behavioral therapy. Hopefully I answered the questions of my opinions about it because a lot of parents have asked me about this. I think anything that gets you to high frequency thinking you should do, that should be the goal because once you get there, you'll be unstoppable. Everything you should do should be with that in mind. Get you, your family, even not just your special needs heroes, but all of us should be in this place where we are living our destiny. We're exactly where we need to be. And when you do that, you get out of bed like a bullet. Nothing that happens to you is going to stop you. It's all going to be used as food to get you where you want to be. Go to bigweird.com. Thank you so much. I love you.